The title of today's message is Killing Time. If you look up the definition for killing time, it is to engage in an active, in, in an active, usually a rather aimless or idle one with the goal of making time seem to pass more quickly or less slowly. Um, if you're killing time, it means that you believe you have time to kill. Right? Got plenty of time. Uh, if you talk to people that are older, they realize they're running out of time. One way or another. Uh, and all the old people just said amen if you're wondering. So, But before we get into this aspect of it, I'd like you to turn to Genesis 4. Um, we uh, celebrate holidays in this country and some associated with military, with wars. Uh, other nations do this around the world. And I think there's actually some confusion, uh, and let's try to clear some of this up. So in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, let's jump in there. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. So God respected Abel's offering. But, it, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should be ruler over it. Now Cain talked with, his with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. So the first recorded murder um, is... Cain and Abel here. Cain kills Abel. Um, so you say, well, what is the difference in killing and murder? Uh, there's some cute confusion because in the, in the Ten Commandments we read, thou shalt not kill. A better translation for that is thou shalt not murder. Two words in the Hebrew, two words in the Greek. One means kill, one means murder. There is a big difference in killing someone and murdering someone. Okay. Now, I know there are a lot of people that say, well, I'm against any type of killing and wars and all these things. There are wars straight up that God called for in the Old Testament. Um, and people were killed. They were not murdered. They were killed. You say, well, it's a te technicality. It's not just a technicality. The Bible says do not murder. It does not say that there's not a place um, for killing. And you say, well... Give me some more. Ecclesiastes 3. To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant. A time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down. A time to build up. A time to weep. A time to laugh. A time to mourn. A time to dance. A time to cast away stones. A time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Um, my grandfather served in the Navy and he survived. Um, not everybody survives. And I think sometimes we think this is just, these, these holiday weekends are just long weekends and it's good for us. It's good for us because it was really bad for some people before us. And when you stop remembering that, things don't go well because people think, well, freedom is free. Freedom is never free and all you got to do is look at the cross and Jesus on it to realize that. Freedom is never free. The captain of our salvation gave his life that we might be free. Another one I'll read you is in Romans chapter 13, and this is talking about being subject to the governing authorities. Um, and people 
are all over the board on this, and even some Christians are all over the board on this. Um, verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? So you're tired of being afraid of the cops? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Now you say, well, but what about, you know what? There's what abouts on everything. But in general, the principle applies. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. And then this phrase, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And a sword is not to, for a spanking. Okay, a sword represents somebody is going to die. So you say, well, I don't believe in capital punishment. Um, it's a, and, and I get that. There are a lot of things people don't believe in they are in the scriptures. Right? You say, well, but I just don't believe that. The important thing is to go to the scriptures and say, God, you tell me what I believe. Right? Well, I don't want to believe what that says. You want to believe what he says. Go to the scriptures. You say, well, I don't agree with you, Richard. It's not about agreeing with me. It's about agreeing with him. Find out what he says. Um, so, I have tremendous uh, respect for and appreciation for people who are willing to die. My wife read me a quote that 90% of the soldiers on D-Day never made it to the end of the day. Kids. Um, whole lives ahead of them. And what? Mowed down uh, for peace. It's such a strange thing that there's a time for war and a time for peace. But sometimes there is no peace without war. And it's a tragedy, but it's a reality. And there's a day coming where it won't exist anymore, but we're not at that day yet. So I appreciate and acknowledge everybody who's served. Um, it is one thing to be an American. It is another thing to be an American soldier. So anyhow. All right, go back to Genesis 2. So, there is a killing time, and it's not good time, usually if you look back over the wars, but there's also another kind of killing time. Um, Genesis 2, 1 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So look what he got done in six days. Imagine if he had not rested the seventh day, what we would have. Um, obviously, that, there's nothing left to make. He made it all. And you think, well, he's God. Is he tired? No, there's a principle here that you don't work yourself to death. Um, if you don't rest, you are going to kill yourself. You say, well, I can't rest. I've got to work. Why do you have to work? Well, i got to feed my family. We get way past feeding families. Okay? When you have passed feeding your family to a certain lifestyle, a certain car, a certain all these things, the accoutrements of life, that you say, well, I just can't live with all this, then these things start crossing, and before you know it, you got no seventh day. you got no Sabbath. you got no rest. You got no downtime. And if you do not stop to recover, you will not make it. Um, so the seventh day ended what he had done. He rested on the seventh day from his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in, in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Um, he blessed the seventh day. Now, you say, well, what does that mean? I grew up where, I mean, you couldn't even breathe heavy on Sunday. I mean, after church, you know, you had to wear those uncomfortable clothes, the Sunday go to meeting clothes, whatever that was. I never could understand why God made me dress up on Sunday morning, but at night you could wear jeans. I'm like, okay, what is he doing? He doesn't care at night or something? Um, so you're uncomfortable to begin with. Then you got to go eat, and then you got to go home, and then you got to lay there and do nothing. Um, there's all kind of ways to rest. Uh, find a way to rest. You say, well, I have to work on Sundays. Find another day to rest. Uh, I try to take off one day a week if I can, and I, this is my favorite thing that happens. I get a text or a phone call, and it always starts like this. Hey, I know this is your day off, but... 
right? Now, if you're dying, I'm, I'm cool with answering that call. But if it starts with, I know it's your day off, I'm not even, you know, I got caller ID. I know who you people are. So, um, <laughs> Psalm 102, go there. Now, I'm going to read you a bunch of verses that, if you're not careful, could be almost a little depressing. Um, and kids, it's a hard to explain all this stuff to kids, but I'm telling you, even if you're young, you've got to figure some stuff out. You only have so much time down here. Uh, even if they freeze your you-know-what and think one day they're going to bring you back, it ain't happening. The Bible says it is appointed a man once to die, after that the judgment. So far, only two people in history, am I getting this right, have not died. Two people got taken up. The rest of them died. Even Jesus died, right? Got raised from the dead, but he died. You're going to die. If Jesus does not return in my lifetime, I will die. And my sand is falling very quickly. In Psalm 102, verse 3, For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. Um, so just poof, just gone. Strike a match sometime and then blow it out and watch that smoke dissipate. That's your life. In the grand scheme of eternity, time and eternity, that's it. Go back to Psalm 39 a few pages back. Now this is a prayer, and I recommend these prayers. Psalm 39, 4. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I, that I may know how frail I am. Um, you're, you're just not, even if you feel like it, I'll tell you something about getting older, I can still do a lot of things that I used to be able to do. It just takes me a lot longer to recover. And you say, oh, that's funny because you're old. That happens to football players. That happens to, to 20, 30, 40-year-olds who cannot do what they used to be able to do because time kicks in and it's harder to recover. It takes more and more rest. It makes, takes more and more recovery time. Um, I got an amen out there for that. That's good to know. Um, verse 5, indeed you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor, Selah. So just poof again, you're gone. You say, well, that's, that's so negative. I want to live. I want to live a full life. Then live one. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, what are you doing with the only life you're going to ever have? And i got to be careful with this because i got people close to me that do this. Uh, if, if you are spending countless hours playing video games, something's gone really wrong. You say, well, how do you define countless hours? I define it as not sleeping at night. Every waking moment that you have free time, you're playing some video game, somebody on the planet trying to do what? Well, I'm getting really good. At what? Right? And not many people say this out loud because there are a lot of people doing this. A lot of kids doing this. And the amount of violence and sexual content in these games is mind-boggling. And you say, well, it's not, it's not hurting anybody except maybe you and all the people that don't get you because you're playing some video game. So, so where are we spending our time? And by the way, you say, well, I'm, I'm just, I, you know, every once in a while I'm just killing time. I'll remind you that all that time you're killing is dead time. Once you kill it, it's dead. You can't get that time back. You say, well, I'm resting. Um, at some point, you're resting too much. You're just disconnected. And for some people, it's video games. For some people, it's porn. For some people, it's shopping. Oh, let's go there a minute. Have a stranger, someone you don't even know, say, hand them over your device and say, I haven't, I haven't deleted any of my content in months. And just let them scroll through and see how much time is just spent shopping. Click, 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 shopping. Well, I'm not buying anything. 
or Facebook. Am I leaving anybody out? I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to be an equal opportunity. Uh, calloused fingers. Like, like, no likey, 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 no likey, 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 no likey. For what? And then you wake up and you're an old person and go, what happened to my life? I don't know. What happened to your life? Psalm 90. This is a prayer of Moses. Some people think all the Psalms are David. They are not. This literally says straight up, Psalm 90. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a, like a watch in the night. Now, if you read that verse and people say, Well, I thought Jesus was coming back. It's only been a couple of days. He said, what do you mean? It's been 2,000 years. From God's perspective, a couple of days. You carry them away like a flood. They're like a sleep. In the morning, they're like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. Uh, cut the grass the other day. It was all green and nice when I started. And by that night, there was some grass left, but it's a bunch of dying grass laying there next to it. And that's your life. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, and maybe... If you're just a strong human being, you get 80. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. And in light of all this, verse 12, so teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. O oh, satisfy, oh, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord, Lord our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Um, wouldn't it be nice to know that the stuff that you're doing with your life has been established by God? Not a waste of time. So you say, well, I want to improve my uh, time management. We got all these or time organizers, planners, books, seminars. Let me tell you a no-brainer way to improve your time management. Spend more time with your scheduler. Politicians have schedulers, computer programs. There are scheduler programs. CEOs have schedulers. People sometimes don't even know what their day looks like till they get to their day. And they literally look down and go, okay, what do, what do we have today? What do you have for me? Doctors, surgeons, sometimes they just go, okay, here's what's next. If you have scheduled what is next and you have scheduled nothing next, Nothing is next. And if someone else has scheduled your life and that's going to go nowhere, then it's still nothing. You say, well, I'm getting a lot done. I'm making a lot of money. What if that's not God's schedule for your life? What if you just crawled, as I keep saying, in a closet somewhere and said, hey, let's work on my schedule for today. What do you got for today? Now, what do you think he's going to say? Well, you're going to quit your job and sit at home and play video games. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing from now on. Probably not. 
Because the same book that says all this stuff says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Right? So you go to work. So you say, Lord, are we going to work today? Yes, sir, we're going to work. That's on the schedule. So what are we going to do there? We're going to do your job. And you're going to do it so well that even when no one's watching, it's like you're working for me because ultimately you're working for me. Well, but what am I going to accomplish? I got you at that job to make a living, yes, but I got you on that job to live. And they're going to watch how you work, and that's going to build respect for, for you in their minds so that when you speak of me, you will not be ashamed of yourself trying to talk about me. And they will have such respect for your work ethic and for who you are as a person that when you bring up Jesus, you won't be an embarrassment to him. And then you have opportunity in that job. I get this all the time. People and the people that get this really get this. I'll get a text and say, you know, I got laid off, whatever. And they'll come back before I even come back. I'm getting transferred. And you think, well, what does that mean? They, they, apparently that's not where God has for them anymore. You say, well, what if they got themselves fired? It's still not where God has for them anymore. They blew that. Or maybe something went wrong and not, no fault of their own. You are who you are only because God made you that person if you're who you're supposed to be. And you are where you are only because God places you if you allow him to do that. Um, at any given time, you know, my girls, have, we have this conversation about work. Where are you supposed to be? Is it about money? Right? You get five job offers, do you take the one with the highest money? Absolutely not. That's insanity. Because the one that you gets paid you the most, if that's not where you're supposed to be, could cost you the most. How in the world do gifted people that could go make five times more end up school teachers, making no money? What if that's where God told them to go? Well, if I'm a school teacher, I'm, I'm going to drive this old car. I'm going to live in this old house. I'm going to do it. You know what? Stop deciding what God can do and can't do for you. Who said all that? Spend time with your scheduler. It's amazing. When I pray with Rebecca before I leave the house and say, and Lord, use us along the way today. A simple prayer like that where you're saying, okay, I'm ready to go. What does that mean? Well, I'm at work all day. You eat. Right? You're somewhere other than in that office. And you've got to be paying attention because God will bring those opportunities because you're at the job you're in with the people you're with, a conversation. Um, if you're just paying attention, you can't imagine how many opportunities there are. I was going to read you Psalm 144.4, but it's just more depressing scripture. So I'll read it to you. Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow, just like gone. Now, you say, well, if that's all true, that is kind of depressing. No. That means you got that long. What are you going to do with that long? Right? You better figure it out. Go to Mark chapter 4. The old man that discipled me told me one day, Claude said this, um, he said the difference in your life will be what you do with your spare time. What you do with your spare time. What do you do with your spare time? Now you say, well, I'm using some of it to rest. I get that. But if you talk to people who use any time they have to read, to seek for wisdom, to spend time with godly people, uh, if you've got spare time and, it, and you're just killing time, you're going nowhere. You say, well, I, that was kind of my plan, to go nowhere. Well, it's working. <laughs> working that plan, I guess. 
Mark 4, verse 13, and he said to them, do, not, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He's talking about the seed and the sower here. The sower sows the word. Now this is going on in real time right now. Okay, This is happening with me and us, anybody listening to this right now. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Boom, it's gone. They hear it, and they're like, before they can even respond to it, bam, Satan steals it away. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So, boom, not gone. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. That's so true. That's so amazing. With gladness they receive it. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Oh, I'm out. Too hard. Oh, too hard. I can't, I can't do that. I can't say that out loud. I'll be rejected. I'll be unliked. I'll be canceled. Can't afford that. That's my whole life. So you hear something and you're excited to hear it. You're glad. It says gladness. But then reality comes along and it's only for a time, tribulation, persecution, and then they stumble. Verse 18, now these are the ones sown among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word. And then what happens? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. I love that little phrase because if whatever the first two didn't cover, that grabs everything else. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. It was about to happen, but here it comes. Um, and then the good news Verse 20, but these are the ones sown on the good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. You say, well, how do I get to pick which of those numbers? You don't. You receive the word, you hear it, you accept it, you bear fruit. Stop comparing your fruit basket to other people's fruit basket. It has nothing to do with anything. You're going to give an account for your life, your time. Run the race that God has set before you, not someone else. Right? Um, this kind of freaks me out a little bit, honestly, because I'm not the smartest guy in the room, and I have some things that intimidate me a little bit, some insecurities possibly. Um, but I'll meet someone and... Uh, or not even meet them. I'll just see somebody walking down the road, someone that you can tell is just a very poor person, no transportation, clothing worn out. And I like say to myself, like, Lord, what, what in the world? Like, I, I, it just it's, it blows my mind the opportunity that I have had and that I have. And what about that person? You know, did they do something wrong? Why did they not get access to education or whatever was missing? And that's what they got. They may outfruit me all day long with what they got and what they're doing with what they got. You say, oh, that poor person. I may be the poor person that when, when you get there, he says, you know what? You were, you're feeling so sorry for that person that seemed to had nothing. They, they, they heard the word. They they accepted it. They bore so much fruit that compared what you could have done, they outfruited you. You say, well, what does that even mean? It means you're supposed to do the most with what he has given you. And we all have the same amount of time. Now this all gets down to if any man desires to come after me again, what does it say? Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And that is not what we want to do. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And Jesus, you can just get in line. Hey, could you talk to that person? Shh. I'm busy. I'm doing what I want to do. 
If we can work that in, we'll work it in. But just, just hush. You say, well, nobody's doing that. What do you think quenching the Holy Spirit is? What do you think all these just pushing him back? You ever hushed the Holy Spirit? I promise you we're doing it way more than we realize. If you wonder how it happens, uh, just watch your kids. Excuse me. Excuse me. Daddy, excuse me if they're polite. Sure, I'm busy. Can't you see I'm busy? Excuse me. They're just trying to get your attention. What if God's trying to get your attention? And ain't nobody got time for that. Well, but I got to do what I wanted to do. And? Where's the fruit from that? Uh, let me say this before I, before I forget to say this. Um, retirement is a very disturbing thing to me. I am yet to figure out who invented this evil. So you're going you're gonna to play in your life so that you can get to a point, lock it down, and sit down and do whatever you want to do for the rest of your life. And that's your plan? My idea of retirement is chomping at the bit. If I'm a business person and I've been in the business world, if I had stayed in the business world and that's what God had for me, I would be chomping at the bit to get enough money in place so that I could quit that job if that's what God had and go to work. Go to work. Discipling people, ministering to people. Like, my gosh, I got all this time now to do what I didn't have time to do before. And then you run the last quarter harder than you ran anything else. Don't let the enemy lull you to death. Ah, take my ease. Here, I'll read it to you in the Bible. Uh, Luke 12. Luke 12, 15. Bring me all your retirement verses, and I'd love to chat about them. Love, I'd love to chat up retirement with you. Let me tell you about retirement. I'm slowly, finally getting some, some, uh, some hairs some uh, lighter hairs. I've been working on this a long time. Um, you know what the book says? You're really not supposed to even pay attention to what I'm saying until I got a white head. A hoary head, the Bible, King James calls it. So if things are going the way they're supposed to be going, and you've spent your life the way you're supposed to spend it, when, you're, when you finally got white hair, you got people flocking to you saying, what's up? Help me. Now, our culture's flipped this back upside down every wrong way you can. And now 20-year-olds are so smart, nobody knows anything but 20-year-olds. Right, they're the geniuses. Let me tell you, you may, you may have information, but you do not have transformation without some application of some wisdom. And we've thrown our old people away when they're the carriers, in many cases, of the wisdom, the stuff we need to really live the way God intended. Don't quit. Luke 12, 15. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. So he's bearing fruit literally, physically. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool. He said, Soul, and God said, Fool. For this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? 
so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Does the Bible say don't lay up treasure? It does not say that. It says don't lay up treasure and not be rich toward God. If you got more on this side than you got on the other side, you're on the wrong side. Make sure you're shipping it ahead. In your spare time, ship it ahead. Now let me go back to the retirement thing. Let's just say you're a total screw-up. You've wasted your life, nothing to show for it. You did what you wanted to do. No discipleship, no evangelism, no nothing. You haven't served, you haven't done jack anything. Then stop and say, God, show me how to redeem the time that I have left. And cry out to him and say, help me. If I've got 10 days or 10 or 20 or 30 more years, help me hit the finish line strong. Send me someone to disciple me, to show me how to do this, to impact the lives of men and women, children, and live the life you intended and let him change your life. There are people in that category sitting in this room right now. Uh, if you're not here, uh, you missed something. So on this stage earlier, um, some musicians played. A pianist, a bass player, a drummer, and a guitar, a guitar player. And if you were here, you experienced something. You say, well, oh, I was listening. I saw it online. You did not experience what we experienced. Why is it that people can buy CDs for X or download some songs for nothing, and then they'll spend 500 bucks to go to some concert? Because there ain't nothing like being there when your band plays. Now, that's a shout out to being here. Number two, none of those men that played today picked up that instrument Tuesday. They just watched a video online and said, oh, I could do this. And then by the day, here they go. Every one of them has been sharpening that ax for years and years and years and years. It took time. Uh, a very specific story, Boots, who plays the, boot, plays the boots, um, he plays the bass. When Boots first showed up, uh, this is a long time ago, and he's one of the greatest bass players you'll ever hear in your whole life. Um, Boots had been playing in bands and bars and traveling and doing that. And so at first, Boots could not stand and play if you go back, if you were here years and years ago, Boots would sit down to play. And you say, well, why couldn't he stand up and play? Because he had stood so long playing his instrument in bars and places that he felt like he was doing that same thing in this setting. And it, it just felt weird to him. It took him a while to realize that he could stand and play his instrument for God and worship. Now, if you weren't here, uh, it was a powerful experience for some because, oh my gosh, they're incredible. They can go. They can play these instruments. But if you know these men, you know it's an even more powerful, powerful experience because they were using the time that they had spent to express something through their hands and their instruments to God, worship, praise. When you do the same thing with your skill set, your ability, you're a teacher, you're a CEO, you're an employee, um, whatever you do, you say, well, I'm just doing a job. No, you say, Lord, I give you my hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, my mind, my skills, my body. And I, I ask you to use this for your glory, somehow for your glory. And, and let my life literally worship you every day, all day long through the skill set that you've given me. That'll change the way you go to work. Amen. Right? I'm not here just to do a job. I am bought with a price. Someone owns me. I'm here to let him live in and through me and serve him. 
John chapter 6. Now, you say, well, it started out kind of sounding like it was depressing. Now it's kind of turning a little bit. Man, this is crazy exciting. I mean, you get one little life, uh, and I'm trying to take care, better care of myself to carve out some more years. I know my buddy John over here, and I'm going to say how old he is, but I promise you, he, if, if he could carve out another 20, he's in. Because he knows he can make a difference, and you only get one shot. When you get to this point, uh, I jokingly say, you know, you start thinking, put me in, coach. And I say, no, put me in first class, but that's a whole other joke. Um, <laughs> you know, put me in, coach. I don't want to be on the bench. If you're on the bench or up in the stand somewhere or not even in the field house, ask yourself, why am I not on the field? Right? I didn't get to play. I played ball, but I didn't get in the games a lot. A lot of the reasons for that but I'd usually try to get near the coach. Because if he's trying to figure out who he wants to put in, oh, okay, you get in. I'm not hiding down in the bench somewhere. Put me in, coach. Let me make a difference. I only got so much time. Verse 27, John 6, 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because, the God, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So you say, yeah, but you got to work to eat. The Bible says it. Yeah, but don't just work for food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. It's eternal stuff. It's the forever stuff, the stuff that's going to matter. Um. I am trying to do at least a couple of things. I am trying to take as many people with me as I, as I can when I go or that come behind me, and I'm trying to leave as many people behind who can carry it on as possible. That's it. So that if I'm laying on my deathbed and I say, okay, Lord, we're about to be out of here, and you go, yep, I'll see you in a minute. And hopefully... Um, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not going to say hopefully. If this goes well, I will not be laying on that deathbed saying hopefully I'm about to hear well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to lay there knowing that's exactly what I'm going to hear. You say, well, that sounds cocky. No, that's the plan. That was on the schedule. Plenty of business people in this room that get year-end reviews. If you go to your year-end review thinking you're going to get your year-end kicked, then you screwed up somewhere. If you go into your year-end review and you know you had a great year and you did everything that was on the schedule and more, you go in there expectantly, humbly but expectantly, because you did your job. And if you don't get a good review and a bonus of some kind, you go, well, what happened? I want some explanation. Live your life in such a way that you hit the finish line, see Jesus, and you're like, okay, I'm ready. Well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Because that was the plan. A little more encouragement, John 9, 4. And this is Jesus talking. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Like, you, you won't have an opportunity when this shuts down. Do all you can while you can is what my mama told me. And she's gone. But her prayers are still getting answered. Ephesians 5, just a few more and we're done. Ephesians 5, verse 15. So this is Paul writing to this church, and this is he's encouraging him to do this. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 
redeeming the time. And redeeming is to buy something back. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. What did he just say? Not as fools, but as wise. And then again he says, therefore, do not be unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And he goes on to talk about that. Um, so look again at verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So if you are wise, what's going to happen? You are going to have an understanding of what the will of the Lord is. Figure it out. You say, well, how am I going to know that? Ask him, read the scripture. For this, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. For this is the will of God, that you, have, that you uh, what is the one about sexual uh, immorality? Abstain, right? This is the will of God. Re over and over, some things flat out say, this is the will of God. So go look them up. Say, okay, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, let's go live that life. Hebrews 10. Oh, somebody sneezing up there. I was going to bless you, but I should have done that earlier, so I feel bad now. Such a tragedy. We live in a country where you have to get sneezed to be blessed. I never have understood that. Just walk in the next restaurant, go up to the table and say, bless you, bless you, bless you. If they look at you funny, say, well, I'm not going to be there when you sneeze, so I'm going to get it out of the way now. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24. Now, this is just simple, practical stuff, okay? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Okay? Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Um, and then what's the next phrase? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now I pound on you every once in a while about showing up on time, about being here when we gather. Now let me explain this to you. If you're a godly mature person and you're sneaking in here and sneaking out, you are not a godly mature person. I need godly mature people in the room when the ungodly show up. When the lost show up. I need scanners scanning. We need people that come in here who are prayed up and look around and say, okay, I've been sitting in this part of this room for 20 years or 10 years or however long you've been sitting there. You know everyone that sits around you. So you're scanning. Look around the room. I've never seen that person before. Holy Spirit says, make a beeline and do what? Consider one another to stir up love and good works. Exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For me, this is a work day. For you, this is a day of rest and a day to work. There are people that show up here early and you know what they do? They walk through the whole room and meet everybody and then they come get me and say, hey, come meet this, this couple from Midland. Midland. You say, well, dude, I just kind of come like it's a movie. I'm watching the movie, and I'm, you know, I brought snacks even, and I'm leaving. And if it gets boring, I check Facebook, and I'm out of here. What are you doing? I just came to be fed. Okay, be fed. Do some encouraging along the way. <laughs> if God sends people to this church, who do you think there's, oh, they're sending them to you, Richard, you're the pastor. Good luck with that. I can't take on everybody. The elders can't take on everybody. Our job is, is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Your job is to be present. So that when somebody does walk in, we swarm them, we surround them, we love one, and the Holy Spirit says, no, not them, you, you go. You're going to connect. You're up. Well, I'm tired, Lord. I'm resting. We'll rest this afternoon. Right now, you're going to be nice to these people. Well, I had a bad week. Maybe they did too. Let's encourage each other. Love, good works. Be, be present. And by the way, I'm pushing. I know I'm pushing. You can't watch at home forever. You say, but 
I get it. If you got a if you got a reason, great, good for you. And for the people that are in nursing homes, there's a man and he's going to see this. I got a friend in California who had a stroke and he's laying in a bed and he's doing better. Hospice is gone now and his daughter's taking care of him. He can't get here. He can't get anywhere. So I'm glad we're doing this for him. But if you're sitting on your butt somewhere watching this when you could be here, good luck with that. I can say it in Portuguese if that would help. (laughs) God needs a body together, time together. And where we have time together, um, someone asked me literally today, did we get here late because the meet and greet went so long they thought maybe they'd walked in on the beginning. You say, why do we take so long? Because we care about people. And people come in here terrified. They come in here nervous, feeling rejected. We still have people that pull up in the parking lot, sit there, and drive away because they're so terrified. What we need are godly people, loving people in the room, ready to go. So when that person makes it in or even looking out in the parking lot and saying, Hey, what, how are you? I'm so-and-so. And this stuff is so no-brainer. If you're a godly, mature person, what in the world? Right? Oh, it went long. Whatever. I promise you, I go eat somewhere after this, and I'm, I'm finished eating. And the black church just letting out, so you, you're getting off the hook. <laughs> they don't eat till 3. Huh? 3.30. I'm sorry, 3.30. <laughs> and they had to get all dressed up usually, and now they got to eat late on top of that, so... You'll be fine. Um, James 4, one more, and then then we'll be done. James 4, 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So what are you supposed to say? Lord willing. Um, There's some things I don't ever want to do again in my life. But before I say I, I will never do this again, I say Lord willing, I will never have to do this again. Because I don't know what his will is, but I want his will more than I don't want to do something again. The fact of the matter is, time is killing you. And if on top of that, you're just killing time, you're gone. You say, yeah, but I made some money. Yeah, but I gave to charity. Yeah, but I, yeah, but I, yeah, but I what? Did you do the will of the Father? Did you do what Scripture even remotely, what Scripture says? So that you can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, Now, you say, well, I haven't. I've screwed it all up. (coughs) Then let's start today. Let's stop killing time. And make it count. And our Father, we thank you so much for uh, your word and for what is possible with you as the scheduler. And I pray that whether it's uh, a gathering of believers where we show up and we're present and ready to go, not just to be fed, uh, the baby birds get fed, the mamas and dads are out gathering food and feeding them. Help us be the birds that have gathered during the week and show up ready to feed as well, and encourage and challenge and exhort uh, to love and good works uh, because we need to be physically together, Lord. Uh, We do pray for those who can't be with us for whatever reason, and we are grateful for technology that allows us to reach them for whatever reason. Father, thank you so much for your willingness to send Jesus, as we have already discussed, as the captain of our salvation, to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, and literally become sin for us 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him because of what he did when he died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead. And if there's someone today, Lord, who does not know you personally, may they simply say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead to save me, to rescue me. I accept the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to come live in me, through me, change me from the inside out. Thank you for loving me, for saving me today. And that I now have an answer when I die, but also have a reason to live. And I ask you to use me, Lord. Make my life count. However brief it may be, make it count for your honor and your glory. And show me what you intended all along. And for us as believers, Lord, uh, help us redeem the time and maximize whatever we have left to the finish line uh, and see how much fruit can be born if we will just hear it, accept it, and let you do your thing and bear fruit in our lives. There is no end to this. We love you, we thank you, we praise you, we trust you, and we look forward to seeing what you have for the remainder of our lives, but we also look forward to the day when we will see you face to face. And our prayer is, even so, come Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. Um, for anybody who prayed a simple prayer um, and asked Jesus literally to take over your life and you know he moved in, please let us know that. You can send a, whether you're in the room or beyond, send a simple email to reunion at reunionchurch.org and just say there, I prayed. Um, finally, it makes sense. I know that he's moved in and I need some encouragement, some challenge, and uh, we are here to provide that and help you in any way that we can. So please uh, let us know if that's something you did because uh, that's what, one of the main things we're about. Uh, and then helping you take the next step and uh, follow him and get in a place where you can help other people do the same. All right, we're going to do the offering. And the way we do that recently is we got two red boxes at the doors. When you go out, we haven't gotten the baskets going yet. Um, we have considered asking everybody to bring your own full basket, and then we'll hand those in. But we haven't gotten there yet. So, um, so we'll get to that. And then you can also go online, reunionchurch.org, and there's a, there's a uh, Give tab there you can click self-explanatory, and lots of people are figuring that out. And again, we appreciate that. All right. Looks like we're out of time. So, way out of time. Um, I just want to point out, though, that in California, it is only, well, it's only 1030 in California, so we're, we're early for those people. All right. Love you guys. Have a great uh, rest of the weekend, and we're going to stand up and sing our way out of here. You're the best, and uh, we'll see you soon. Let's stand together.